First of all, I would like to welcome you all uh, for taking the time and, out and uh, being here today. And of course, we would like to thank Nora Lustig for accepting our invitation to present uh, her work in our research webinar series. So first of all, allow me to uh, present Nora Lustig, who is Samuel Setstone Professor of Latin American Economics and the founding director of the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University. She's also fellow in several relevant institutions studying development, which includes the Brookings Institution, the Center for Global Development, and the Inter-American Dialogue. Her research focuses on economic development, inequality, and social policies with a emphasis on Latin America, and she has published extensively on these topics. Uh, among her recent publication, it is worth mentioning the Commitment to Equity Handbook, estimating the impact of fiscal policy on inequality and poverty. And I think it's also relevant to know that among other relevant roles, Nora serves on uh, the G20 Eminent, Eminent Persons Group on Global Financial uh, governance. I would say this is just a glimpse of her vast experience and expertise in these topics. And today's um, today presentation will be on the persistence of income inequality in Latin America. Um, and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Nora. Nora will be speaking for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we will be able to. Um, we will. Uh, I will bring in some questions and comments based on her presentation and the paper she has shared with us. And then we will open up the floor for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, to do that, you can either use um, the hand up tool that you have here, or if uh, because of any reason you, don't, you prefer to write on the chat, I will then read the question and uh, put it forward for uh, Nora. So I think um, that's all in terms of the topic and how we, we intend to organize the session. So now, yes, um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Nora Lustig. Nora, please. Yes, thank you. Let me start by thanking eBay, you, Andrea, and Matt Nine for the kind invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here and make a presentation on the work that I've been doing on income inequality in Latin America over the years and also some more recent work that we have been uh, putting out on the impact of COVID of, uh, on inequality and poverty and social mobility, looking into the future of what the lasting effects of this crisis might be. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting my PowerPoint, except that now it's gone. <laughs> it was right above, uh, it was on, on my screen, but I think there it is. Thank you very much. And uh, please let me know, Andrea, when I'm about five minutes before ending, I may ask you if uh, you know I am, I am how much time I have as uh, you know at, at certain intervals. Okay. The PowerPoint that I sent you <clears throat> can be shared as long as people are kind enough to cite the uh, work, the, the citations that I put on it. And it's much longer than what I'm going to be able to present because uh, I like to usually share more with. Uh, uh, interested parties to see whether they want to go more in depth and they can also then access the work on the papers that are our background to what I'm going to present. So I'm going to talk about three things today, the inequality in Latin America, what's been its evolution and the determinants of this evolution. Second, uh, as we know, in the last uh, few years, uh, right before the pandemic, we had a wave of protests in Latin America and uh, there is uh, some puzzle because uh, when, as you would see, when you look at what's happened to inequality in the last 30 years in Latin America, inequality is lower in principle in practically all countries. So one puzzle that people started to address is why is it that you had falling inequality with rising protests? And finally, I'm going to like I said, present some results of what we're finding in terms of the impact of the shock associated with the pandemic and uh, its effect on inequality and poverty, both in the short and longer term. 
So the first part of my uh, presentation, so sections one and two, will be based on this working paper, which is also in Spanish. It's available in Spanish, by the way, but in a chapter, it's going to be a chapter for uh, the 50th anniversary celebration book for CAF, the Latin American Development Bank. Okay, so let's start with inequality, what's happened and why. <laughs> it, one interesting thing is that I'm going to show you some graphs is that uh, now I think it's an established fact, but at the beginning it was a surprise. But uh, if you compare data for the early 90s and <clears throat> uh, 2017, which is more or less the most recent uh, data point for which we have information for most countries, inequality in Latin America declined. But we have three distinct periods. Uh, the first one in the 1990s so it could summarize was a period of primarily rising inequality. For the countries for which data is available at the time, we didn't have as uh, much coverage in terms of country data as we do now. Then between 2002 and 2013, inequality declined in practically, I mean, in, in every country. Uh, and uh, with every indicator and from every database that you use, uh, you'll see that that's a pretty robust result. Since 2013, the trend has uh, clearly shown signs of exhaustion. And in some countries, inequality continues to fall, but at a slower pace. In others, it doesn't fall anymore. And in some, it started to rise. Uh, notably in Argentina and Brazil, we see <clears throat> increasing inequality happening in the last few years. So there's been some reversal. But as we'll show, I'll show in a minute, overall, for the entire period, it's true that with the data that comes from household surveys, inequality declined for the 30-year period. So I'm going to show you some graphs here. Uh, let me just briefly tell you what they show on the horizontal. Can you see my cursor? Because I don't think I can use uh, a laser point here. Is it, is it visible on there? No, I cannot see okay, it. OK, so I'm going to have to describe. The horizontal axis shows the Gini coefficient for the early 90s. And the uh, vertical axis shows the Gini coefficient for around 2002. Remember that the Gini coefficient is a summary indicator, one of the most frequently used to measure inequality. And the only thing that's important for uh, viewers to remember is that the closer it is to 1, the more unequal, the closer it is to 0, the less unequal. So countries that are here are less unequal. Countries that are here or here are more unequal. And what I'm showing here is that uh, let's assume that there was no change in inequality between the period of early 90s and early 2000s. Then all the dots would fall on the diagonal. The diagonal is the dotted line. Any dots that are below the diagonal are an indication that inequality was falling. And any dots that are above the diagonal indicate that inequality was rising. And as you can see, the frequency of dots above the diagonal is higher. So this was a period in which we say there's been rising inequality, the 1990s. And it was uh, related to lots of phenomena that were happening in the region, including the fact that you had uh, market-oriented reforms, some of which resulted in higher wages for skilled workers, and that laid behind higher labor income inequality, which then resulted in overall higher inequality. The next one is going to show us what happened in the period in which inequality fell. Please look at the fact that every single dot is below the diagonal. So it means that every single country in the region experienced a decline. And again, you know, uh, this data, which here I show with the Gini coefficient, can be found also if you use other indicators of inequality. This data comes primarily from the uh, socioeconomic database of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a house in the Universidad de la Plata, CEDLAS, in Argentina. And it's joined with the World Bank. But if I use data from UN ECLAC, CEPAL, I get similar results. Maybe the orders of magnitude vary. But qualitatively, it doesn't matter what source you use. You find that this phenomenon was uh, 
pervasive of declining inequality. So I'm going to focus on this period because, as you know, it's very unusual to see countries experiencing declining inequality and more unusual that you see it for an entire region and for a period of a decade. The next slide is going to show what happened since 2013 and uh, to the most recent point I told you is around 2017. They're all circa, or so around that uh, year. And here you can see how the sort of auspicious story of declining inequality is no longer the case. We see some countries in which inequality continues to fall, but much, much more slowly below the diagonal. And we begin to see countries in which it doesn't fall at all on the diagonal and countries where it begins to rise, for example, Brazil, which begins to be above the diagonal. If I add in more recent points for Brazil, it was going to be even further above the diagonal. And uh, I always like to mention that uh, there's one interesting story that people haven't studied enough, and it's the fact that we've witnessed quite remarkable declining inequality in Central America. For example, Salvador had continued to experience declining inequality. And uh, over the entire period, you also will see that Guatemala and Honduras showed a decline in inequality. And those are countries that have been understudied. What's happened in Central America? I always leave it as a question mark so that I invite people who are thinking about topics or thesis, uh, it might be an interesting work. And also, if you're looking for research uh, subjects, that is certainly one area that has been understudied. Finally, I'm showing here what happened during the entire period. And as you can see, 90, early 1990s and the 2000s, uh, 2017, circa again, around 2017. And as you can see, with the exception of Costa Rica, every country is below the diagonal and Paraguay is on the diagonal. So for the entire period, even though we had rising inequality at the beginning and some, uh, uh, some countries experiencing also a increasing inequality or no, no decline in the third period, the second period, what happened during the period of declining inequality dominates. And as I promised, I'm going to show you that this also happens if you use other indicators. For example, here I'm comparing the share of income of the richest decile divided by the share of income of the lowest decile. The uh, dots sh are shown below the diagonal for practically all countries, which means that the decline in inequality can be captured with different type of indicators. It does not rely on just one. It is a robust result. And as a result of this, as a result, as a consequence of this uh, phenomenon, uh, what you can see on the second uh, set of, uh, of uh, rectangles, I show what's happening to Latin America. In the rest, I have the other regions of the world classified according to the World Bank classification system. And what's notable is the fact that inequality in Latin America is the region where uh, it experienced a decline. In other places, there was an increase, like in North America, no change or a slight increase, like in Africa, or very slight decreases, like in Asia, and uh, a little more in Europe and the Middle East. But in Latin America, if you use the Gini coefficient, the decline was about six points of Gini, which is huge. It's very unusual to see the Gini coefficient moving so much. Uh, as you know, or those of you might have heard that uh, people say that watching the Gini coefficient change is as entertaining as watching the grass grow because it changes very little in general. And as we can see, that's not been the case, and particularly it's not been the case uh, for Latin America in, in, in big time. Okay. So then the next question is, what's behind this change in inequality because we uh, are in a way, puzzled by something that's been so pervasive. And uh, in what sense it's been pervasive? A lot of people point to the commodity boom during this period and say, OK, you know, countries were going faster. The public sector had more resources as a result of what the boom meant in terms of tax collection so they could spend more. That's true. But as I showed you, 
inequality declined also in countries that were not experiencing a boom, for example. If you think about which countries grew the most, it was during the boom years, it was Argentina, Peru, Colombia, Chile, uh, Uruguay, to a lesser extent Brazil, all of South America is the one that, that uh, experienced the commodity boom and grew fast. But then you had countries that were commodity importers like El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica, they also experienced a decline in inequality in that period. Mexico, which is uh, neutral in terms of its role vis-a-vis -vis commodities because uh, it exports oil, but it uh, also exports a lot of manufacturers. Then you see that uh, growth was very moderate to mediocre, and it still experienced a decline in inequality. So it's not the boom, it's not growth, which distinguishes uh, who who had, uh, which countries had uh, experienced a decline in inequality. It is also a period in which the 2000s, for some of you who do more of the political analysis, will remember that this is the period in which the countries, many of the countries in the region were governed by leftist regimes. At some point, about 10 countries had been uh, under a leftist regime, 10 of the 17. But Again, inequality fell in countries governed by the left, like Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Ecuador, and so on, and Chile also, uh, and countries that were not governed by the left, like Colombia, Mexico, and so on. So it's not the, the if you want the sign, the ideological sign of the regime that differentiates which countries experience a decline in equality or not. Our work on this subject then, I started working on the subject with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva when um, he was a chief economist at UNDP. Now he's a director of the Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean. And we published a book in 2010, which was the first of the work that was put out trying to understand why inequality had been falling in Latin America. By the way, when we started that project, we started with the idea of trying to explain why inequality did not fall. And yet we found it fell, and so we had to explain what was behind that. And we came to the conclusion that there were two main factors. One was uh, the decline in labor income inequality that resulted from access to education that had changed the composition of the labor force, making workers with lower levels of education relatively more scarce, workers with relatively more education, like above secondary, relatively more abundant and the market worked and the wage premium that workers with higher levels of education used to capture before started to fall. And that's primarily what's behind, that's a big chunk. I'm going to show you now uh, a quantitative decomposition in a graph on how much is explained by that. The other thing that happened during this period and it happened in practically all the countries uh, cash transfers targeted to the poor were introduced and were made more generous in some countries. So this was another factor of why inequality declined during this period. And if you want to give quantitative estimates or weights to which factors uh, were uh, the more um, important, this is uh, an average for the entire uh, region. And as you can see, over 60% of the decline in total income inequality was explained by the decline in earnings inequality, which is a light blue, about 17% by the fact that transfers became more generous and more progressive. So the decline in inequality in the distribution of transfers contributed about 17%, which is the orange, 15% is the gray, that is private transfers, which is primarily remittances. So in the countries in which remittances play an important role, which is the case of Central America, they also had an equalizing force. Now, let me start by um, telling you uh, right away one of the limitations that uh, we have with this type of analysis. You may see that, for example, capital incomes, which is the dark blue, were also equalizing. However, for those of you who have worked with household surveys, one known fact is that capital incomes are really badly captured in household surveys. Particularly, that means that we do not really uh, 
capture well what's happening at the upper tail of the distribution. The top incomes tend to be underrepresented or underreported in surveys. So this is a partial story of what happened to inequality. And later, I'm going to show you what might have happened if we start correcting the data for the lack of uh, visibility in this type of data of what happened to capital incomes and therefore top incomes. So uh, what I think that the story is vis-a-vis -vis what we can measure so far, which is total income inequality without capturing well capital incomes, but very importantly, capturing what happened to labor income inequality and to transfers, is that we had uh, quite a remarkable expansion of access to education in the 1990s in many of the countries. And uh, this is probably what was behind the change in the composition of the labor force, which led, which led to this uh, reduction in the wage premium for workers with higher levels of education. So the story one, the story is one of, uh, yeah, there is policy behind it, and it's policy directed to education, making access to education much more pervasive. Practically all countries ended up with universal uh, access to primary uh, education for uh, the ch cohorts of children that were entering primary education in the 1990s. And then, you know, they went on to secondary. And over time, this is what is driving the, uh, this is an equalizing force that is probably still there, except the pandemic may put a pause. And this is something that I'm going to come back towards the end. Let me skip this here. So the other thing is that uh, we know that in most countries we've had uh, the introduction of government transfers, uh, cash transfers. It started with Bolsa Familia and Progresa in Brazil and Mexico. But then <clears throat> practically every country has some form of those, which uh, since they're targeted to the poor, they tended to be an equalizing force in every country. <clears throat> What about the political regimes? Because they were reinforcing factors. I told you earlier that inequality fell both in uh, countries governed by the left and countries governed by non-left governments. And yeah, that's true. However, as I show you in this graph, the blue is the average for the region, the gray is the non-left countries, and the orange is the countries that were government, governed by the left at some point during the period. And as you can see, as you can see, while all <laughs> the countries experienced both the non-left and the left experienced a decline in inequality, it was more pronounced under the leftist regimes. So the reinforcing factors that produced by the leftist regimes, what were they? We've been uh, working with uh, some other colleagues, uh, some uh, Herman Firehart, who is a professor in uh, Universidad de San Andres in Argentina, and uh, <clears throat> my colleague Wei Long at Tulane. Uh, and what we found is that there's suggestive, uh, inf um, there's suggestive information that perhaps one of the key policy levers that made the Lexis government more equalizing. I'm, changing, I'm talking here about the order of magnitude, not the fact that both were equalizing, but the order of magnitude was higher for the left, perhaps was the fact that they introduced greater increases in real minimum wages. And here you can see a graph that shows that. We're also testing this econometrically now, and the results tend to suggest that that may be the case. So you see here that the average is for increasing minimum wages, the average is the gray line, the blue line is for the non-left countries, and the red is for the left countries. And as you can see, the increase was higher among the left uh, countries. So this was a reinforcing factor that explains why inequality fell faster in the countries that were governed by leftist regimes. Okay, so let me switch now to the, you know, some a question that I found puzzling before I, uh, you know, we could remember, remember that, you know, for the entire period, even though inequality was rising in the recent period in some countries, for the entire period, 
inequality had fallen. All the, all the data points except for Costa Rica are below and Paraguay, which is on the line, they are below the diagonal. So inequality was lower. So why were people protesting when things have gotten better? And I am going to share with you a few uh, conjectures at this point, you know, because these are probable causes. We, we think that this has to be researched further quite intensely. And I think that one is clearly the end of the party. For the countries that uh, were experiencing the commodity boom, uh, regardless of whether inequality continued to fall or not after the boom was uh, over, what started to happen is the poor became worse off and also the middle classes became worse off because growth started to falter after the end of the commodity boom. So there was a situation of unfulfilled expectations and frustration that I think lies behind the uh, unhappiness that was uh, tr trigger in many countries of uh, big protests that manifested themselves, especially in 2019. We also have a problem with indicators that are commonly used for measuring income inequality and also problems with the data. I already pointed out that the data that we're looking at doesn't capture what's happening at the very top because it doesn't capture uh, capital incomes well. And I'm gonna show you that stories may be different different once you begin to do that. So what about the shortcoming of the indicators? Let me mention a couple. One is that uh, we measure inequality using disposable income. Disposable income is what people have in their pocket. Then they go and buy things and they pay certain prices. What happened during this period is that the uh, prices started to rise for some, for some of the commodities because for some of the goods and services because subsidies were being phased out as a result of the end of the commodity boom. So if we measure, if we were able to measure, we can't now because we would need a series, what happened to income inequality with what we call consumable income, what people can really buy, perhaps we wouldn't find this uh, auspicious result in after 2012, it could have been much more dramatic what's happened to inequality. The second thing that uh, might be happening is that even if the Gini and the ratio of the shares of income at the top and the bottom fall, those are relative measures of inequality. Even if those fall, the differences between the richest and the poorest continue to increase. And probably maybe people may be reacting more to absolute levels of inequality than to relative levels of inequality. Because especially in a context in which poverty is rising, and even if the relative measures of inequality show a decline, the absolute levels rise and people that are at the bottom or in the middle sectors are worse off, the uh, discontent is probably going to be high. And finally, there's limitations with the data because as I said, the data that we use on household surveys doesn't capture what happens at the very top. And I wanna show you a few results when we use corrected data, which may lead to a different story. I'm gonna show you something for Brazil, Chile and Uruguay. This is work that has been developed by uh, people at the Paris School of Economics They're part of their thesis. This is uh, from uh, Mark Morgan, who's written his thesis on Brazil. They're all available online and they're cited in the paper that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. And as I sh I'm showing here is a share of uh, the top 10% uh, of the uh, population, if you use survey income versus if you use fiscal income, which includes information on top incomes from tax data, or if you use national income, which also includes uh, undistributed profits and makes it uh, the most comprehensive measure of inequality and of top shares. The survey, which is the orange, shows a decline of the top 10%, which is consistent with the story that I told you earlier. But once you start including information from tax returns, the green, and from national accounts, the blue, as you can see, the top share no longer declined. And it's much higher than what uh, it was when we used survey income. So when you include 
capital income, then the story may be different. And that's probably one of the reasons why we also see a disconnect between what, between what we thought might be a nice, uh, pr uh, pr nice progress, which the pro progress existed on labor income inequality, but what's happening when you take into account what happens to the very top. The same thing happens for Chile. This is the top 1% of the uh, share. This is a thesis by Ignacio Flores. And uh, the orange is, again, the top 1% if you look at uh, just survey results. And as you see, well, you see a decline, a trend, declining trend. Whereas if you uh, use the corrected data that includes information from tax returns on that capital incomes, no longer. That's the blue the share is higher and it no longer declines. And finally, I have the same uh, story for Uruguay. This is again the top 1%. This is uh, work that uh, Mauricio uh, De Rosa and Andorito have been doing and others. And um, we can see that the decline that you observe with the survey, which in this case is the blue, is not replicated once you start correcting the data and incorporating top incomes. So while it's true that inequality declined, particularly when you look at labor incomes and what's happened to transfers, both public and private transfers, when you start including what happened to capital incomes and what's happened to the top, the famous top 1%, the story is not as auspicious. We have a high concentration of income and probably not a decline if you include the top 1% uh, corrected for, or top 10% even, corrected for the absence of capital incomes in household surveys. And I'm using the word probably a lot because this is still work in progress and all these uh, data is the result of using certain correction mechanisms that may not be, uh, that you know, one needs to test the robustness and see whether all the results are systematic and not just the result of using a particular way of correcting the data. And we're, by the way, we're working on this. Uh, okay, so now let me switch gears to what does COVID mean for the story of inequality, both in the short and long term. And I'm going to be quick because I think I am about to uh, exhaust my time, right, Andrea? No, I think you still have 10 minutes or a bit more. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to be showing you today on this part uh, links with a previous story, remember that I mentioned, okay, we, we can say that for over the entire period, over the 30 year period, there was a decline in inequality measured by earnings inequality, what happened to transfers, what happened to transfers both public and private. But when we include capital incomes, maybe the story is not as felicitous because concentration at the top is still quite pervasive in Latin America. Nevertheless, what we want to see is whether the part that had to do with the auspicious uh, dimension of the story, which is labor income inequality, what might happen now with COVID and what might happen with, uh, with the longer term impact on social mobility. And there are things that are worrisome, uh, both from the short term, but much more from the longer term. So what I'm going to show you, to you today, uh, we have two working papers already out. One is uh, with two of my students, Valentina Martinez Pavo and Federico Sanz, and a colleague, Steve Younger, at the Commitment to Equity Institute. And then two other pieces uh, of work that we're doing with Guido Ned Hoefer from Zoo in Mannheim and Mariano Tomasi, who is a professor in the Department of Economics at the Universidad de San Andres. The, and the first two papers are available already. The third one is about to be put out in the next two, three weeks. So we are going to be showing, I'm going to be showing you results uh, of what the short-term impact are for uh, particularly four countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, which are the largest in Latin America, and also in terms of the impact on education, both inequality, poverty, and uh, educational achievements in the longer run for these four countries and what, what it means. 
But first, let me uh, remind you that uh, Latin America, among the uh, non-advanced countries, among the emerging countries, so some people call them, has been hit particularly hard. Latin America, because it's a middle-income, urbanized, uh, highly urbanized region, has been hit much harder than Sub-Saharan Africa. It has been hit much harder than East Asia, which has been able to do a good job in containing the uh, health and economic, and therefore the economic impact in the end uh, to their countries. And uh, here I'm sharing with you a few indicators that show how hard it's been hit. Latin America is disproportionately represented among the infected and the dead because with 8% of the population, it has 28% of all cases, close to 30 and over 30% of all deaths. And the four countries on which I'm going to focus today are consistently shown among the top 10 countries in terms of infections and of deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. If you look at the data that is produced by the Johns Hopkins uh, website, you'll see that there have this uh, position pretty much systematically uh, for several, several weeks, if not months now. It's also going to be hit very hard in terms of economic activity. The last uh, IMF projections, which were uh, put out in the regional economic outlook in October, uh, predict a downturn of over 8% for 2020, with uh, Argentina being hit the most, almost 12%, then second Mexico, third Colombia, and Brazil. Brazil was the only uh, good news in, in the uh, October outlook compared to the one that was uh, published in June because it's the only country in which the contraction is lower than it was predicted in June. Nonetheless, it's close to 6%. This is huge. I hadn't seen numbers like this, not even during the uh, the uh, the debt crisis of the 1980s, you saw this uh, tremendous impact on the region and practically every country experiencing a huge blow. In addition, uh, UNESCO estimates that about 160 million children and youth were out of school uh, due to the school closures that had to be implemented as, a, as part of the containment of contagion. Uh, this has left an important differential impact, which is what I'm going to come to, in terms of what uh, children that are living in high in, in in households that are more educated, by that meaning, with parents with more than secondary school, versus children who are in households with low educated uh, parents, and this is something that I am going to. Uh, emphasize at the end of the talk as a problem that probably needs the biggest focus of attention moving forward if we want to avoid that the region not only uh, undoes a little bit of the progress that was obtained during the 2000s in terms of labor earnings, but it could result in a much more fundamental reversal if the impact is pervasive and affects all children that are part of families with low educational background. So what do we do in these uh, papers is we ask uh, uh, for the short run, what is the potential impact of lockdowns on inequality and poverty, which income groups were hurt the most, and to what extent the expanded social assistance programs have been able to compensate for uh, the uh, effect of the crisis. And for the long run, one of the key questions we want to ask is, okay, so what's the impact of the uh, pandemic on, on uh, high school completion rates uh, for children of different parental backgrounds? And to what extent policies that were implemented to mitigate this impact have uh, narrowed <clears throat> or have offset the, uh, the negative impact? For the, I'm not going to have time to go into the uh, methodology. It's all explained in the uh, papers, but we don't have enough data now to sort of do empirical analysis based on data. So both analyses are based on the creation of simulated scenarios that try to replicate the effect. 
uh, by uh, using either micro simulations in the first case and in the second for the long run we use counterfactual uh, simulations uh, based on information that we have from Latino barometer in terms of educational achievements for children of different parental backgrounds for a period that spans about 30 years you can get from Latino barometer and for the short-term effects we use household surveys and we shock them <laughs> we micro simulate the adverse effects that the uh, impact of the pandemic could have had perhaps you know for the first one for the short-term impacts i'd like to share a graph that is uh, interesting to look at this is the composition of gross income uh, on the horizontal axis you have families uh, per, the household per capita income from the poorest to the richest moving from left to right and on the vertical is the composition of income by type of income in which what I'm trying to, what we're trying to do is identify what part of the income <clears throat> is at risk as a result of the different effects that lockdown policies have on sectors of the economy. We know that the non-essential sectors were the ones that were affected the most. We know that people who had access to internet and could continue working remotely even in the non-essential sectors were probably able to keep their incomes unaltered. And so we simulated these and we have a pre-pandemic description here. And I want you just to look at one thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of two, two you know, two, two bands in this, in, this, uh, in these graphs. This is Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico. The orange at the bottom are the cash transfers, the government cash transfers, which, like I said, were introduced in the last 20 years. And what they show is that even if they're small <clears throat> in per capita terms, they do provide an income floor for the very bottom of the distribution. As you can see, they're concentrated in the very bottom. So the poorest of the poor have a bottom, an income floor, that they didn't have before, before the, uh, these uh, transfers were introduced. Another part of the income floor, especially in the case of Argentina and Brazil, are the light gray, which are contributory pensions, and the light blue, which is public employment. The dark blue, so that's the other thing I want you to focus. So you have a floor at the bottom, primarily driven by what's happening to the orange, which are the government transfers, the dark blue is income at risk. And as you can see, the income at risk tends to have like a U-shape a U -shape, uh, form, which means that the income at risk is higher not for the bottom. And again, this is a result of the income floor of the cash transfers. It's higher for people who are moderately poor, vulnerable to poverty, those close to the poverty line, and also people in the middle of the distribution. Nora? Yeah? I'm afraid now if you can, uh, could you finish in five yeah. minutes? So me, Would that be okay? Okay. Yes. Thank so you. I'm going to show you, okay, what happens to inequality and to poverty when I do this analysis, I produce three types of distribution, the pre-pandemic, the post-pandemic without expanded social assistance, and the post-pandemic with expanded social assistance. And as we can see here, uh, you know, I'm showing you, this is the Gini coefficient pre-pandemic. Here I show two scenarios, depending on how the losses are distributed. The impact without social assistance can be quite significant in terms of increases in inequality. This is a Gini coefficient. And interesting, and here also for Brazil, we see it could have been uh, important, but once you include the expanded social assistance, you can actually offset the effects. These are the effects. Compare gray with gray, uh, red with red. And you can see that uh, the social assistance, particularly in Brazil and to a lesser extent in Argentina, were quite important in offsetting the effects in the short term. Uh, less so in Colombia and not in Mexico because Mexico did not expand social assistance programs. 
We also see that the impact on poverty were quite, uh, I believe here there's a typo, I should say, on, on poverty, where I say social assistance in Brazil and Argentina significantly have set the effects on poverty, not on inequality. You can see that uh, the impact on inequality, uh, sorry, on poverty, either the national poverty line, which is the top, or the 550 international poverty line, $550 per day. And again, for two scenarios, one in which losses affect primarily fewer families, but a lot, and the bottom, more families, but less. The losses are significantly offset, uh, or rather the rise in poverty significantly offset in the case of Brazil, to the point that in some scenarios, poverty might have been lower, it's predicted might have been lower, than it was pre-pandemic, and this has been found also by some other researchers, uh, less so in the case of Argentina, much, much less so in the case of Colombia, because the expanded social assistance is much lower, and none in Mexico. So Brazil is spending about 2% of GDP in the new social assistance, Argentina over 1%, Colombia about a third of 1%, and Mexico did not introduce any expansions of existing or new social assistance programs to uh, mitigate this. And as I said earlier, the, when we look at the distribution of the losses, uh, it's not the poorest of the poor who experience the most of the losses. In fact, after you include the social assistance, the uh, poorest of the poor do experience an increase in their income uh, compared to the pre-pandemic. And uh, the losses are much bigger for the moderate poor, the vulnerable, and the middle income. So now let me show you what happens to the longer run and the effects on, on education. I'm going to show you the final the results. So, you know, we, we look at what uh, happens to the probability of, of likelihood of completing high school comparing children that come from uh, families with uh, low educated parents and families that come with high educated parents. And the main differences are threefold. The children from high educated parents tend to live in households with higher connectivity. Second, they will probably go to better schools who can replace uh, the uh, curriculum to online teaching more effectively. And third, and very importantly, they have parents that they can coach, they, they can coach the children that are doing homeschooling, or they can hire tutors because they have the income to hire tutors to actually replace the teachers uh, from in-person schooling to homeschooling. None of that happens to the bottom of the population, even to the children that come from low educated parents, even if you include the policies that were introduced by the government to mitigate the effect of school closures, particularly in trying to expand offline and online education, which some countries did uh, better than others. So what you see here is that the likelihood of completing high school for children that are of low educated parents, which is the red bars versus the blue bars, you can see that especially, for example, look at Brazil and Mexico, the likelihood of completing high school is almost halved by the uh, effect of the pandemic for children that are in the red group, even after the mitigation policies. Whereas children that are of high educated parents, which is the blue group, are not touched. So what does it mean is that this group will probably have a tremendously lasting effect. And what we see is that the red group, which is low educated parents, is experiencing a high school completion rate probably similar to the cohorts that were born in the 1950s or 60s instead of the recent cohorts. So this being left behind can have a lasting effect on their ability to become, uh, you know, uh, to, to have the skills later in life to be part of the uh, labor market and uh, obtain higher wages than they would have, they're le being left behind, and it requires probably what we call now, <laughs> we, we, we call a crusade on the part of governments to rescue this group, particularly among the vulnerable ones, 
uh, during what continues to be still the pandemic, but also after the pandemic. And uh, this implies that which governments will not, should not rather, uh, cut down education spending, maybe they will need to re devote more resources to education spending and introduce a number of policies that will be able to uh, remediate uh, what's been lost to some extent in, in structural loss and learning abilities of the group of vulnerable children. If this affects not just, for example, children who are about to complete high school, but affects the entire uh, cohort of children, the entire generation of children that are today in school at different levels, the impact could not only affect the affected children, but also have macroeconomic effects in terms of growth potential, because then the average educational population will be lower. And it could also affect social mobility and the quality of opportunity and the quality of outcomes more broadly. So that's why we think that uh, attention to what the effects of the pandemic is on education is of foremost importance, and that's where the uh, policies that we're considering in moving forward have to be uh, taking it as high priority. And I would end this, this with this, and thank you very much. I'm ready for questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, Nora, for your presentation. Um, this was certainly very comprehensive and detailed in um, to get more information on how inequality has uh, worked during these years in Latin America, and more importantly, uh, the effects of the current pandemic, right? So this raises several issues regarding the role of uh, politics and policies. So uh, I'm going to keep my comments um, questions short so that we can give more time for the people in the audience to um, bring forward your, their questions because I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of questions um, in the audience. So uh, let me briefly um, ask you two comments, questions. So, um, and I will focus mostly on the the ways in which uh, governments have reacted to the pandemic, right? So uh, it's very clear, because I read the papers, but in your presentation it was also very clear, um, that uh, when it comes to the, um, the, the short-term effects or impact of the pandemic on poverty and inequality, uh, the implementation of these assistance programs have been very relevant, right? And this is the case specifically for um, Argentina and for Brazil, to a lesser extent in the case of Colombia. Uh, and it's quite surprising to see that nothing has been done uh, in the case of Mexico. So based on your expertise and all your research on inequality and social policies in Latin America before, uh, my first question is, what would be explaining the difference in these various responses to the to 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 the pandemic, right? Because uh, one can think of the uh, political party variable, but this does not seem to be explaining why we have this type of assistance programs in Argentina and Brazil, and um, not uh, in the case of uh, Mexico. Um, the second comment has to do with education, because again, your research shows that uh, the expansion of education was key, uh, especially uh, during the 2000s, right? Um, and I find it puzzling in some countries, I would say Argentina, uh, the reluctance of governments to open up schools. So I totally agree with you that this is going to have a, a, a long-term effect that's going to be uh, um, quite problematic for development, for social mobility, for health, and so on. At a time that even the pandemic seems to be introducing more uh, division across the education system, right? So, for example, in Argentina today, people are talking about blue schools, meaning black market schools, right? Uh, following the logic of the blue dollar. Um, and finally, um, I'm, I'm, I'm much concerned, and I think you also argued that in your presentation, 
um, about the long-term effects of the pandemic, right? So uh, certainly these policies that have been implemented have been very, I mean, in the case of Argentina and Brazil, have been uh, relevant to um, to prevent further deterioration in terms of poverty and inequality. But you make it very clear in your paper that um, in order to deal effectively with these long-term effects and consequences, um, we need uh, other type of policies, right? But we are all aware that, in fact, um, in Latin American countries before the pandemic, these countries were undergoing very difficult fiscal and micro, uh, macroeconomic situations before, and I would say that the pandemic has exacerbated these very hard situation. Um, so the question is, how can uh, Latin America be able, and governments in the region be able to provide these policies? Um, what role can regional banks, what role can multilateral institutions play um, in these, uh, I mean, in the post COVID world, um, especially as you mentioned at the very beginning, right? So these are um, uh, middle, middle income countries uh, and these that's another problematic. So I keep my comments, questions at that. Um, and then uh, I don't know if you want to answer now or shall I collect more questions for the, from the audience? As you wish. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, let's let's collect some more questions, and then you, you you will be able to tackle everything together. Yeah, would that be okay? Perfect. Okay, so um, let's see if there are. So if you are interested in asking a question, as I said at the very beginning, you can just use this hands up tool here, or you can write your comments on the chat. Yes, Matthias, please. Hi, <clears throat> Noah. Now I am, yeah, they just switched my role, so that took a little while. Anyway, um, thank you so much. I enjoyed your talk a lot. Listen, I was wondering uh, about the connection you have drawn between um, between protest and, and declining levels of inequalities. Yeah, and I wanted to, to ask a little bit in, in, in that direction. And um, the first thing is, I mean, why would we expect that there is a relationship between inequality and protest in the first place? I mean, is there an established pattern that declining inequality leads to a rise in protest? Because it seems to me, yeah, um, this looks almost like a little bit like a pressure cooker model of society or the reverse one of it, um, that in, in um, in social movement studies, it's a little bit um, outdated. But so that's the first. I mean, um, can we really? Um, I mean, where does this premise from come from that decline in protest or increase in protest um, has something to do with inequality? Um, the second, and and just kind of going with your premise, um, I was wondering. I mean, you're saying maybe it has to do that inequality didn't didn't quite reduce in the way in we anticipated it, but. I was wondering to what extent it has to do with other variables. For example, so what you had in, in many Latin American countries during the 2000s is, is sort of these, these rise, what some have described as new middle classes. Yeah? And, and those folks yeah, who moved from, yeah, from poverty to not quite poor anymore, but also not rich, but this has changed their, their preferences. They suddenly became more concerned about the quality of public services, for example, education for their children, and that this then, um, yeah, made them more concerned about things such as corruption, um, public service provision, and so on. And and I'm asking this because many of the protests you've seen over the last 10, 15 years are not so much directly concerned about inequality, but about things such as corruption and political scandals, but also, um, yeah public service provisions such as transportation costs in, in in Chile. So I think, yeah, that how do you relate your research to, to, to this to this explanation? And then more generally, 
you know, in the early 10,000, in the early 2010s, you had a you had a global protest wave. Yeah, starting with the with the Arab Spring and then with the protests in Spain, the Indignados, and you know, and sometimes these these um, protest modes spread, and and there might not be even in not the kind of right structural conditions. Yeah, they they kind of instigate protests. It's sort of like a diffusion model, if you want. So. I mean that as an as a potential alternative explanation to why do we see the rise of protest during the 2010s, and it might not be as much related to inequality as it as or as as you set out that it, that it could be. So thank you. Maybe I'm, I'm very curious to hear your your thoughts on these points. Sure. Nora, uh, would you like to collect more questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, if you don't mind, can I, can I, can I show you a graph to uh, Matthias? Yep, yeah. sure. Uh, can I, um, can I, can I, I have... Do you have it in your picture? Yes, yes. That goes to his first question. But uh, I, yeah, all right, thank you. Which I didn't show in my presentation, so bear with me. But you can go back and see it in the yeah so i'm not an expert on this uh, uh relationship between protests uh, and inequality but uh, i when i was writing the the piece a chapter for CAF, i was writing about what happened to inequality inequality declined and then you had this wave of uh pro protests at the same time so i thought i had to put out some conjectures and what uh, we do find is that um, the perceptions of people in terms of whether distribution of income or distribution of income and wealth is unjust or very unjust uh, changes uh, from being, you know, there's fewer people, if you look at the, what's below the diameter, the, in, in, there's more countries which uh, more people think that it is not unjust or very unjust in the mm. period in which inequality declined and then once inequality begins to not decline anymore or begins to rise which is a subsequent period 2013 2017 the percentage of people that in those countries this is latino barometer that find that the inequality may be but or the distribution may be just or very unjust very unfair increases so mm -hmm. there seems to be a link, at least in terms of perceptions. Um, that that's uh, that's uh, one thing. But I I agree with you completely that I think that uh, it would be a sort of very simplistic and wrong way of understanding the dynamics of the protest if we just linked it to what happened to inequality, even if we have some evidence that people are getting concerned when things are not moving in the direction yeah. that uh, they like because i agree with you that it is a protest i think it is a protest of unfulfilled expectations a lot that's very and nice that's why i mentioned that's why i mentioned that even if inequality continued to decline which it didn't in some of the countries the fact that uh, countries were experiencing lower growth rates or even recessions that was a heavy blow, and like you said, to the middle class. I think that created some of the fatigue. And second, like you said, I think the fact that there was, uh, in some countries, I think every country has its own idiosyncratic pe peculiarity that explains why in that country it manifested itself in a particular way. But uh, the services, particularly in Chile, where they're privatized and access has been limited and even if it's uh, there like education then when you graduate you do not make enough income to pay the debts you had accumulated and in the individualized accounts of the pension system people when the pension the time for, to become a pensioner comes the size of the pension is so small that you cannot live on it so there's a lot of frustration about what that, that model meant over time for people that thought it could mean uh, greater opportunities. And finally, you pointed out to the transportation costs, et cetera. That's when I said that, you know, we measure inequality with the income that goes to people's pockets, 
but that doesn't take into account what happens to the prices of what people pay. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the elimination of or reduction of subsidies in energy, transportation, food that happened during the, uh, after the 2012 boom was over, probably also created quite a bit of frustration and discontent among the middle sectors, which include the lower middle classes, some of the moderate poor, those who are above the poverty line but near it. So, so that, that would be if I were to write on that where I would start looking for what is it in, in, in every country. So I don't know, Matthias, but that, that, that helps answer uh, the, the question. Uh, now, let me yeah. uh, address Andrea. Uh, I think you pointed out to three things. One is the political, well, that the political party doesn't predict the response, and I think you're right. We have, to, we have to wait and see how all of this plays out. But so far, the contrast between Brazil and Mexico are quite striking. No? In fact, uh, uh, I think one should write a lot contrasting Brazil and Mexico. Hey, Brazil is governed by Bolsonaro, a right winger. How come he deployed this immense safety net to help, uh, you know, that covers about 50, over 50 million people, no people that are receiving benefits, and that happened in the, the lapse of two, three weeks, to the point that the transfers may leave the poorest of this group better off than before the pandemic. Turns out that uh, the programs were primarily pushed by Congress, and so it was not Bolsonaro's party that was pushing them, it was the opposition, but in the end, what happened is for Bolsonaro, it was it worked because it actually gave a boost to his popularity, so he liked it, <laughs> and that's why it con the the program continued for a while. Now it's being um, phased out. In the case of Mexico, uh, Amlo has peculiar ways of being a leftist. I don't know anymore if we're going to classify him as a leftist in the future. He, you know, he supports Trump. I think he still didn't congratulate Biden <laughs> for winning the, the election. So we have some peculiarities about uh, what uh, the leader in Mexico is about. What I can tell you is that he has been opposed to uh, counter-cyclical policies at the macro level. It's the only country that has been very uh, sort of stern in terms of not expanding spending during this period, in spite of the IMF advising for countries to increase spending. The IMF has been giving advice which is different than in other crises. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons is that uh, uh, AMLO doesn't want to be stuck, uh, Lopez Obrador, in a situation in which eventually he has a debt crisis and has to go to the IMF. So he's ultra conservative on the fiscal side. Being ultra conservative on the fiscal side means he doesn't have money to spend on social assistance. So what happened is he advanced some of the payments, but they have not been yet, they may be converted into actual transfers, like the social pensions. He's given some lending, and I think he's also asking, uh, in the case of private sector, by I think prohibiting layoffs and other things that He's transferring part of the cost of the adjustment directly to private sector firms in the form of lower profits. But uh, that's as far uh, as I can go in terms of uh, comparing those two countries. I'm not a political scientist, as you know, so I always say this is coffee table political science for me. <laughs> but it's uh, quite interesting what happened there. Education and school openings. You might have heard that I didn't pronounce myself on openings or, or closures of schools. I, I do not have a definitive position on that. I think that uh, the closure of schools was necessary in some uh, because uh, you know the the lack of control of how this virus spreads is uh, and the the fact that we don't know sometimes how it will spread intensity and the situation that it creates of emergency, especially in the health sector, is not just what happens to, to, to the, I mean, you, you don't want to have your health sectors collapse because that would have an effect not just on the health uh, related to COVID, but to all the rest. So I, I am not taking a position on whether you have to or not open schools. I think the school openings should be seriously considered and implemented whenever it's possible. And probably you should focus the school openings, given what I said, on helping that 
population which is most at risk or falling behind, which is the children of lower income families. So if you can open it only, if you can open schools only for certain groups or admit certain part of the population that's in school, start with the, with the children that are most, most at risk. And uh, that is uh, my, my response to the, to the issue of, uh, of, of schools. Uh, and regarding what uh, policies more broadly in terms of what to do in the future, I think you're right here. The regional banks will have to play an important role in helping the uh, economies recover. There's, they, it's very important that from these expansionary policies that were undertaken in many of the countries with more or less, if you want, expansion, Mexico in one extreme, extreme probably, um, I don't know which one is in the other extreme, maybe Peru, where it didn't work that well. Uh, the reining in of the fiscal deficits has to be done gradually, because if it's done too drastically, then you risk uh, shocking the economy, producing more poverty, and affecting even more the education side, in this case, on in terms of income shocks, if you don't have the health shock. Uh, and also the fact that you're not going to be able to spend on education what you need to spend in order to, to do this remediation and rescue and recovery of the groups that were badly hurt uh, during the pandemic in terms of their learning achievements. So you want to have a slow land, uh, you know, soft landing of the fiscal deficits. Uh, in addition, because you don't want to have to start raising taxes like crazy, which would hurt the middle classes a lot. And that's where the multilateral organizations, the development banks, can help with uh, lending, long-term lending, that may bring the possibility of having soft land, uh, landing of the fiscal deficits over time happen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you got the first question, the three questions, thank you. I think Pablo Astorga has a question now. Pablo, please. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Let me pull my camera on. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nora, for a very interesting presentation. Let me share the, the video. I, ju I was looking back at the title of your presentation and I saw this persistence. Yeah, when I read the, the title of persistence, we are going to have a bit of a discussion on institutions. Yeah, and but that was not the case. And also, the title gave me the impression that what actually was a presentation about that there was very little progress, unfortunately, in, uh, in reducing inequality. Because that period that we thought that was the good news, as you clearly, well, as you argued, may, may not be the case. So if you exclude that, fall in the 2000s, I mean, and they say at least there was more or less steady or stable inequality. So what we have since the 1970s is rising or more or less plateau on the rising again. And then for what you said about if after the commodity boom, that was already this reversal of the what we thought was falling inequality. And what then you said about post-COVID is bleak. I mean, the news are uh, not good. Uh, so it seems that we are going to be, we, we have uh, another jump or, or rise in, a strong rise in inequality from a region that is already still high inequality. Uh, and this time will be nothing to do. We cannot blame it on Kuznets. Okay, so this is a, con con a, 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 a combination of all those forces that were already before COVID and added the COVID uh, forces. Um, so my, my, my point is probably if we bring in back institutions, uh, this view that with politics is the way out, we may be putting a lot of uh, optimism in the reaction of government, particularly across Latin America. And then with protests, uh, 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 Matias will say, well, this not clear that is related to inequality. It may be more clearer that it's going to be related to increased poverty 
And that's going to be an added problem in the region when we have, you know, back uh, protest because of people in hunger or, and then it's, it, you may need to go back to your previous contribution on the strugglers in the 1990s, a paper I liked uh, very much. And it, it seems to be that they are going to be back. Uh, and that's, pr that's bad news for the region. Bad news for the region. Okay, that, that was, uh, just, was just a, a comment and I'm, I'm probably adding a bit of pessimism to, <laughs> to what already is a, 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 a troublesome, a bleak view. Thank you. Do we have other comments or questions? I think we don't, Nora. So if you want to respond to Pablo's questions, comments. Sure, yeah, no, thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, all right, so first of all, you know, even if the story of inequality over the uh, longer period is not as pretty as our results using household surveys may indicate, I do think we need to note that earnings inequality fell during a period of time, that it was related to educational expansion, and that also we had a role played by public and private transfers. That story we shouldn't lose sight of. Remember that the outcomes are a product of many causes, some of them reinforcing, some of them offsetting each other. So had we not had this equalizing force on earnings, on transfers, then the story about inequality in the 2000s would have been much worse. Even, you know, it would not have been one of constancy when I add capital incomes, it would have been rising inequality. Okay. So that, that I think we have to uh, always emphasize because it's not something to throw under the rug. Having said that, we still have a very unequal region were probably what you, when you talk about uh, institutions, etc. You probably wanted to address the issue of state capture, and state captures may still be quite prevalent by elites and by organized groups in the, depending on the country, which still policy in their favor, and that that is something that uh, is a stumbling block. I tend to think, and we'll see because now there's a group that's been formed that's going to look at inequality led by the London School of Economics, group by Chico Ferreira and others, uh, like a, the Inequality Commission that Angus Deaton did for the UK, that another advanced country is going to be one for Latin America. But I tend to think that one of the, at the core of lasting inequality in Latin America actually are ethnic and racial factors. And uh, we need to understand better why is it that there is so, the persistence I associated a lot with, with this, which is also part of the persistence of inequality in, in the US, for example, or in South Africa. It repeats itself. And uh, this is something that we need to understand better because um, we don't know to what extent is still the result of discrimination and at what point, uh, and what else is preventing from uh, having these uh, huge gaps still between, for example, in countries where the indigenous population is high between the indigenous and non-indigenous. Even though there's been policies trying to correct for that now for 10, 20 years in some countries. So we, this for me is uh, at the bottom line of the persistence, structural persistence of inequality in Latin America. And I don't have an answer why. I mean, I am afraid that uh, it's still a question mark. And I may be wrong. Maybe it's not, not the main factor. But I have concluded after studying this that this is a major factor. Uh, finally, I think you're absolutely right about protests and discontent and the strugglers. Um, I'm going to start using the, the word strugglers again when I, I think the strugglers are probably the ones who lost the most near, during COVID, okay? If we think about the group that uh, in the paper with Nancy Birdsell, we identified as the strugglers is those in the middle, those close to the above the poverty line, but who still didn't make it to an established middle class and a shock can put them back into poverty or reversal in living standards as very uh, frustrating. So what you're saying 
And you know, and it's as a research question, it's very important. People tend to link behavior, I mean, inequality behavior to political outcome. The inequality data is anonymous. You don't know where people were in the ex ante versus the exposed position. They're not the same people necessarily. People move around. So that, that means anonymous. You, know, you don't know. When you calculate the poverty indicators, inequality indicators, before something happened and after something happened, you rank people from the poorest to the richest. But you don't know if the people who are now poor are the same people who were poor before, or there are people in the middle class who became poor. So we need to use different types of indicators, and I should have mentioned that uh, earlier, We have to do with mobility. So I think that downward mobility is probably what may be the trigger factor of political discontent and protest and, and you know protest to ex, to an extent or the lack of upward mobility when you were promised that you were going to experience upward mobility we need non anonymous indicator a mobility indicator by definition is not anonymous you track the person over time before after something and that's the ones that we need to use to uh, probably analyze what may be driving in the past, protests and also in the future, both downward mobility and the lack of expected upward mobility. Okay, so thank you very um, much, Anora. Thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Okay, and thank uh, you for your questions. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read out uh, a question we have in the chat box by Anna Ayuso, so I'll read it out. Uh, despite the fact that the results in the reduction of inequality in the past decade were not as good as it seemed, what lessons can be drawn about what was done well and what would be missing? Tax reforms, formalization of employment. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. That's a great question. So I think one of the main lessons is Beware of uh, not, uh, you know, of, of, of continuing to push for equalization of access to education, both in terms of quantity and quality. Because now, you know, whether you've been able to achieve, achieve universal primary education, and in some countries you're moving into very high coverage of secondary education, the problem we're facing in the region is the uh, heterogeneity in terms of the quality of learning as uh, you probably have seen in the work that has focused on that. So that's one area that's very important to uh, so equalize opportunities in labor markets and also make sure that we have equalization of outcomes so that the premia attributed to uh, you know, higher having higher access to educational levels, both in quantity and quality, can be continuously lower over time. You know? Uh, the second lesson, and this may be linked to the discussion about uh, whether the region should comp contemplate the introduction of universal basic incomes. Um, I think that uh, what we found is that the cash transfers with uh, some extent of targeting, the pro-poorness of cash transfers, is important. It's important in the context of limited fiscal resources. If you convert the same pie into a universal, universal, I mean universal, even, even if the universal is not the entire universe of the population, you will take away the ability of using those resources to help people at the very bottom. And I still think that we should have it if you want as a permanent system of transfer something that's targeted to the poor. However, I think we need to have a system in the social protection scheme that includes the right to a basic income. So when people are hit by a shock and they're not covered by cash transfers that exist or by the social protection that is in the form of social security, they will be able to be helped through ad hoc expansion of transfers. What we learned in the pandemic is that that's possible. People were thinking it was not possible. At the beginning, remember, everybody was saying, oh, in Latin America, with such a degree of informality, you're not going to be able to reach those who are not in the registries of Bolsa Familia, 
and are not in the unemployment program, uh, form unemployment program in, in Brazil. However, Brazil was able to deploy a program that reached more than 50 million people in a few weeks. So it is possible. Maybe it was not perfect, but we have to learn from the experience of making this possible because moving forward, you may want to have an institutionalization of these mechanisms that are deployed when needed, not on a permanent basis in terms of spending. They're permanent in terms of their ability to respond when they're needed, okay? So that would be the, the second. And thirdly, absolutely, we need to look into tax reforms. I do think that uh, we know that in Latin America, especially at the very, very top, taxes are quite generous. <laughs> the tax system is generous to the very, very rich. <laughs> Uh, because they're able to legal and not so legal means to be able to pay little in taxes compared to what their wealth and incomes are. And maybe you cannot achieve a lot in terms of the resources that you collect with that. They're not going to be insignificant, but they're not going to be able to do away with all the problems, uh, social challenges you have in the region. But it's a way in which you begin to address the issue of state pressure on the part of the elites. Now, maybe you cannot have tax reforms that um, <laughs> go after the elites precisely because there is state capture, so we'll see. Okay, thank you very much, Anna, for the question. And Nora, I have uh, another question here in the chat box. It's by Mateus Simons. Um, he says, I saw the impact of transfers was about 17% responsible for inequality reduction. Do you think that policies like conditional cash transfers is a tool that could be explored more to reduce inequality? The answer, short answer is yes. And uh, because, like I said a moment ago, I think the targeted uh, pro poor transfers, by the way, you know, the, the word conditional makes people nervous uh, because they, they're seen as something that uh, uh, almost, you know, impose a, a punishment on people if they do not fulfill certain requirements. I like to view them as partnership between the beneficiaries and the government who, uh, gives the transfers, they can be designed in a way in which they don't become like a espada de Damocles on the very poor. And uh, they can be designed in a way in which errors of inclusion are not so minimized because that's what we found as a problem in some, in some context, like in Mexico, people were criticizing the fact that in poor indigenous communities, the not so poor were excluded, but they were still quite poor by the country standard, and that created divisiveness that you want to avoid. So you can design them in a way in which they're not extreme, if you want, in either what they require from the families or beneficiaries and uh, <clears throat> a, what the conditions are in terms of means or what I means testing to have access to them. And I think they can be an important, very important tool to combat poverty in the short term because they provide cash and also help in the uh, so development, the human development of the next generation because they include components, especially when they include components that address issues of early childhood, education, health, nutrition. Thank you very much. Let's see if there, is, there are any other questions or comments. Hmm. Okay, so people are thanking you for your comments, Nora. I thank them for their questions. They've been great questions, really. <laughs> That's good. So um, if there are no further comments or questions, I think um, the only, I mean, I mean, people in the chat are saying great presentation. Thanks, Nora. I'm reading out the comments. Um, everybody thanking you for that and I would also like to thank you on behalf of eBay for accepting our invitation, for taking the time to um, give this very interesting and in-depth presentation of where Latin America stands today in terms of inequality and specifically the challenges the region faces in the coming years as a consequence 
of uh, COVID-19. So, Nora, again, thank you very much. Um, just to finalize, uh, I'd like to tell the people that the video will be online. And I don't know if Martai would like to give the final words for this session as coordinator of the research webinar series. No, I think there's not much to add. Um, if all that, I mean, <laughs> the only thing I can add is that the next seminar will be on um, the 14th of December by uh, Laia Balsells, Leslie and Daniels, and they will talk about um, electoral benefits and costs of territorial issues. This one will be at the usual time again at 1.15. And uh, yeah, I can also only say thank you to uh, Professor Lustig for a very interesting uh, presentation. Okay, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Andrea and Martin, and thanks, eBay, and thanks to all the participants. And hopefully, next time we'll do it in three dimensions. Would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to that. Okay, bye okay, bye then. Bye bye.